grew up in a home where our elders, we were with the elders. The children were not shunted aside. Uh, and as part of that rich heritage, I'm also glad to introduce you to my cousin Mary, who's visiting from Pennsylvania. Mary and I are, uh, we represent the 31 Hamilton grandchildren. So there was lots of storytelling going on. And, and Mary and I have really enjoyed the love through the years, become richer in recent years, as Mary's also a nurse. So I'm glad Mary could visit us today. So another high point of my life was that I was a somewhat reserved, you know, proper Western Pennsylvania girl. Went to Nyack College and met this very secure, self-assured boy from New York. So the story goes on from there, and that was absurd. Um, I would also say that I had a professional career that unfolded much more by grace than by design or intent. Whatever you think is good to say. Um, that the doors opened, opportunities presented. I said yes. Sometimes I said yes because Serge believed it before I believed I could do something. But that's the story of my life. Perhaps not un unlike the lives that, that many of you have lived. I have also had now over 40 years in healthcare. 20 of those years I have, as, as Paul mentioned, been privileged to serve on the boards of retirement communities, which have been both learning opportunities for me and I, and I would hope service opportunities. I'm the vice chair of the board of Shell Point in Fort Myers. I'm the chairman of the board of the Alliance Community for Retirement Living in the Land, Florida. And I'm on the board of the National Lutheran Communities and Services, which is based here in Rockville, Maryland. So I've learned a lot, and I, I, I value those interactions as I watch good people provide good services every day. Another high point of my life that I believe has instructed and informed how I feel about this topic is the, the opportunity to partner with my siblings as we support our mother in what, what we call in our field, aging in place. And my mother continues to do that well. She lives in, in a small apartment. She's uh, 85 and a half. I'm doing well. Um, still a little cranky about the fact that we don't let her drive in the beltway. But other than that, I would say my mother is doing quite well. And for that, we give great thanks. Um, we also, I think that my, my feelings on this topic were informed by a recent opportunity that we had to downsize from a fairly spacious townhouse to a two-bedroom condo in Old Town, Alexandria. Uh, this move occurred a couple of years before we imagined it. Our life plan had us doing this several years down, but the perfect place came, and it was the timing was wonderful. It really gave us the opportunity to think about what really matters, where do we want to spend our time, where do we want to spend our money, and I decided I didn't want to spend my time dusting three floors of townhouse anymore, but I'd be happy with the two-bedroom dusting experience, so here we are, living in Old Town on the 10th floor, overlooking the Potomac River and loving every single minute of it. I would also say that my concept of reminiscence is very much informed by being a grandmother, especially our younger granddaughter, Naji, always says, tell me a story, Dee. tell me a story about when you were little. Uh, tell me a story about when Daddy was little. And one time she said to me, tell me a story about when Grandma was little. I said, you're really going to have to check in with Grandma on that story, because those are her stories. But I, I love, the, love when children want to know about that. And that gives us an opportunity, doesn't it, to reminisce in a way that we might not otherwise do purposefully. And I believe reminiscence has a new meaning, because I recently, as in September, got that very special health care card with a blue and red stripe on it uh, and turned 65 and I'm now part of what uh, demographers call the young old. That's me. <laughs> so those are the, the high points. I don't know how many of you, how many of you are in the health care field? I certainly know Kathy and Mary and Ruth. Well, we have gone through a change as of October 1st, and you may have seen this slide. Uh, we now have a new, coding system, a new coding system that has five times as many diagnoses as we used to as we used to use. And help you if you don't use the right code or the right extension, Medicare just won't pay you. So it's really important that you get these right. So this is a, a comic that I love, or a cartoon that's going around on Facebook where he says, I don't always get sucked into a jet engine, but when I do, I use, and then that's the ICD-9 code. Another thing you need to know about me is that I have been officially diagnosed. I have my own code, and I took time to look that up. So this slide is specifically for my friend Clyde, who diagnosed me. I don't always cry, 
But when I do, I use this ICD code for being, <laughs> for being emotionally, emotionally labile. Clyde has said I'm emotionally incontinent. And it's good for you to know that on the front end <laughs> because, because that is both my strength and my weakness. I do get tearful. I, I don't cry at supermarket openings, but when I, apparently, apparently there is a very short synapse between my heart and my tear ducts. And you should know that on the front end because some of what I share with you may cause me to be tearful. I'll be fine. I'll recover. I have a handkerchief in my purse. So, so here you go. I have my own ICD. So what is reminiscence? Because I do a lot of teaching and speaking, uh, we always want to start out with some, de uh, some definitions. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on this. But recognizing it, it's an act or a process of recalling past events. Sometimes our reminiscence is an image. Uh, sometimes it's a narration, it's, it's a talking it through. So does this definition work for us for our purposes this morning? Reminiscence? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I won't turn this into, you know, Psychology 101, but I believe that Erickson has it pretty well, well spelled out when we talk about the stages of life. The first being uh, trust versus mistrust. And the goal always being these, these things that I've listed for you in red. I would also say, if any of these slides are of even marginal interest to you, I will send you the whole PowerPoint and do what you want with it. So for that reason, I'm not going to read every slide to you. But I wanted you to know that the thoughts I'm sharing with you from my professional field are scientifically grounded. It's not just that I'm a nurse and I love people and how fun is that. It's that what we do and how we do it uh, is, is scientifically rooted and grounded. And, and Erickson provides some of that. Uh, and these would be the last, uh, the last four of the eight stages. And most of us, I would say, maybe Brian or Sunday, a little bit before this, are at the, at the last two stages where we talk about generativity and in integrity. And generativity being that stage of life where you begin to process what has happened in my life that needs to be given away. When we do this in the professional field, we talk about redundancy. We talk about succession, succession planning. Who is coming to, to replace the work that we did? And then the final stage under the model of Erickson is the integrity versus despair. And really the choices are between making it make some kind of sense, even if it doesn't make perfect sense, making the whole of our life come together in a way that, that saves us from despair. And for any of us who've worked with seniors, we've probably met and experienced those folks who cannot bring the integrity together in their life. So this is one way to look at it. And then this is just another, another slide capturing all of that, which you may not be able to see very well back there, but I think, I think it, it lays it out in a good, a good format for us. Another theorist is Maslow, who talks about our hierarchy of needs how we begin with our physiological needs and think about a baby, all the things that we do for that newborn, and then safety and love and belonging and going on up to the stage that we call self-transcendence. Uh, Whoops, I'm sorry, Deja. Sorry about that, just showed you all my good stuff. <laughs> don't worry, I don't have any sunsets. <laughs> sorry about that. that was You're done. Huh? You're done. I'm done. <laughs> uh, another, another model that I was exposed to just a couple of weeks ago, and Kathy, I don't know if you know this, this physician. His name is Dr. Powers, Al, Alan Powers. Yeah, I've heard uh, Two weeks ago, I uh, went to a wonderful conference in Boston. Over 8,000 providers of senior services. It's Leading Age, which is the national association rep representing those of us who provide these services in the not-for-profit uh, sector, and he was one of the presenters. And I was attracted to go to his session because he was addressing enhancing the well-being of, of patients or residents with dementia. And dementia is a particular interest and topic that I address in my work. So this was just a model that he provided to help us think through what are the needs of that cognitively impaired resident or, or patient. I probably should give you definitions if you're not in, that, in the world that we live in, that residents are those for whom that setting is intended to be their life, their place where they will continue to reside. Patients are short stay. If you have a hip or a knee and you go to a rehab center, you don't want to be called a resident, you want to be called a patient because the intent is that you will go back to live elsewhere. So if you hear me you're, you're 
the words patient and resident, you might see the distinction there. So this is a slide that I think is, is worth thinking about. But I love this slide because I think it fits so nicely with the conversations that Dr. Rennix has been having with us. And I don't want to spill the beans or take his punchline, but I, will ho I hope you'll kind of think about this model when you hear the message this morning that, that Dr. Rennick is, is providing to us. Now, I have the benefit of being one of the small group leaders, so I've seen the cliff notes to the message, so I know where he's headed, but I think it's kind of fascinating, maybe even providential, that we're looking at this here in wrestlers, and we're going to hear an expansion on this, this idea in the message to come. I will not, this could get very ooey and gooey, so live with me for the next couple of slides, and then, then we're going to go and talk about how this applies in my work and in my life. Uh, so transcendence is a theoretical concept, and it talks about, uh, as nurses, and I'll speak from the nursing perspective, how we help people to live outside, beyond them, internally, to, to make peace internally, how we help them make peace with each other, which would mean with us as well, how we help them think and live beyond the immediacy of the place where they might be living geographically, and to think beyond the time in which they find themselves. And if you can help someone achieve this level of development, all of the other things that we face at this stage of life are reframed. They, they take on a different perspective. So caregiving and transcendence, really that's the job, the therapeutic relationship that we as nurses have. We aren't just taking care of their wounds as my, my cousin who is a specialist in that area, which is a much needed uh, specialty in our field. But even as we provide those skills and we do those tasks, uh, give medicine, give care, assist with activities of daily living, the way in which we deliver them can help our patients or our residents achieve this level. So um, does that make sense? I mean, um, certainly for those of you who are in the field, this is not new to you. but. So when you think about the work that a nurse does, whether it's in your life or in the life of someone that you care about, whether it's a parent that's in a care setting, remember there's much more to that relationship than what you see going on in the immediacy of that moment. How many of you have read or heard this book? Uh, it's, it's a recently released uh, Being Mortal. Did you, what did you think? Was it well read, well written, something to think about? I would love to see us have a book discussion about this through the lens of our faith. I think it would be a, a, a great discussion. Uh, I was privileged at this conference that I just mentioned to you to hear him speak. So he did a presentation that was really reviewing many of the concepts of, of his book, but it, it, was, it was a very powerful conversation that then led to many other pockets of conversation throughout the rest of the conference. I think this is a good comment to help us think about where reminiscence can fit in. The battle of being mortal is the battle to maintain the integrity of one's life. And as we see some of our skills fade and our strengths and our self-perceptions begin to fail, it is hard to hold it together. <coughs> and so he says this is the challenge. Look at the power of the verbs that he uses to avoid becoming so diminished, made smaller, dissipated subjugated, brought under the power of someone else, that you become disconnected from who you were and who you want to be. Now this has all kinds of levels of meaning in my work, from those who are short-stay patients and they're coming in to get rehabbed after some procedure or replacement, to those who are pretty cognitively advanced. The challenge for nursing and caregiving is to make sure that we don't put them in a position of being diminished even though their cognitive skills have declined, or that we don't put them in a position of being spent, spending their energies on the wrong things, like defending themselves for one thing, or being subjugated, brought under uh, the power of our choices for them. Another area of focus that I spend a lot of time on is what we call person-centered care or person-directed care, where we really try to facilitate the daily living for that person as they would want it to be, uh, and not to constrain or restrain them. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story that, that Dr. Powers told that was so powerful and such a reminder to those of us who are in practice, told of a story of a gentleman being recently admitted to an assisted living and he was admitted to what we call a secure unit. Please don't let anybody ever call it a locked unit. That's not a word that we like to use. A secure unit, meaning that there would be alarms and there would be parameters which, if breached, would alert staff 
that this person needed some assistance. But soon after he came, uh, and it, this was in the countryside, and he was shaking this door, and he wanted to get out, and he for sure wanted to get out that door. And the staff would restrain him, they would bring him back in, and they'd redirect him, all the things we're taught to do. But finally, a wise administrator said, tell you what, let's see where he wants to go. So they opened the door, and out he went. He went to the fence that was adjoining their property, which had cows on the other side of it. And he put his arms in the fence, and he just took in the scenery, and he came back in the door. So they were discussing this event with his family, and they said, well, that makes sense. Our father was a farmer, and mom would fix breakfast. While she was fixing breakfast, he would go check on the cows. So he was going to do, to live out the pattern. Now, a wise staff would try to explore the meaning behind that behavior rather than trying to stop the behavior because we didn't, we didn't assign meaning to it, which is a real important mantra. Whether or not you're working with memory-impaired residents or, or, or patients or family members whose cognition is declining, if you come through the door that says that, mean, that behavior has meaning to that person, our job is to decipher and to discern and to try to come alongside that person and help to identify where possible what the intent of that behavior is. It may make no sense to us. Rattling that door and trying to get out of that safe building may, made no sense to many nurses, but somebody had the wisdom to say, let's just see. Let's see where he wants to go. Uh, there's, do you know the name Bill Thomas? I don't know if any of you do. He's a real mover in the field of long-term care, and he has identified the, what we call the three plagues of, of the nursing home existence, boredom, loneliness, and helplessness. And the truth is that sometimes we place physical safety and security above the, the personhood of that person. And sometimes taking a risk to be a little less safe uh, is worth the risk, if I can say that. We've figured that, that, that out because we now don't tie people down. Thankfully, over the last 20 years, we've come to appreciate that physical restraints don't get the job done at all. But there was a time where we, we put the physical safety of a person above, above the emotional security. So, so Bill Thomas is a name you might know or hear. Uh, so ways that we reduce boredom and the benefit of boredom, I don't think I'll dwell on these slides because I want to get on and talk, but um, there are ways that we can use reminiscence to reduce boredom, to pick up the threads of conversation that even the most cognitively impaired resident might offer and follow that thread to see where that thread might lead us in the life of that. <coughs> and then teaching. Sometimes if you're working with a resident who has cognitive impairment, by reminiscing with them about some part of their life would help to reteach them about something that was a skill that they had before, and we can help them retrieve that skill by allowing them to reminisce uh, some part of their life. This, okay, this is when my ICD-10 will kick in, so fair warning if you need to leave now because a crying speaker upset you, see ya. Um, this is a project that I first saw in a Kendall facility up in Pennsylvania. And on this wall, the, the res they had had the residents as an activity outline their hands. And so all of these hands were just pictured on the wall or, or posted on the wall. They were beautifully done. They were in frames. They were very artistically done. And attached to each of these was a story. And the reminiscence exercise that they did with these folks was to say, tell me the story of your life through your hands. And so these would be some stories that our hands would tell. These hands have milked cows and pitched hay and made sheaves of wheat and picked berries and peaches and plums to can. These hands have cared for two sets of twins. There's more story here. Sewn and mended clothes, ironed and done laundry. These hands have helped to birth over a hundred lambs. Mm -hmm. These hands have kneaded over a thousand loaves of bread. These hands have wiped tears from the faces of my own dozen children. This was in a Mennonite community, that, so you can imagine that. I loved this idea. I thought it gave a vehicle for conversation to allow people to express things that they might not feel so comfortable expressing if you just said, tell me about your life. Uh, so telling it through the image of your hands. and You might just stop for a minute and say, what have my hands? You know, where have my hands been that, that can tell a different story than I might have imagined? So I took this idea to a family reunion. Unfortunately, Mary was not there that year. 
the Hamiltons continue to have big family reunions. And so I took photos of everybody's hands that was willing to play, and I gave them all cards, five by eight cards, and I said, say what you'd like to say about your hands. My mother is the one who wrote the first two sentences. So I have, I have all those cards, and I have those photos on, on, a, on a disc, but I've not been able to bring myself <laughs> to finish the project because my father's hands are pictured and my father passed soon thereafter. One of these days I will get the strength to, to see his hands and to put his story together with his hands. But if you ever want to talk to a child or to anyone who's at any level of cognition, use the image of the hands because I think it's a wonderful vehicle. What do you think? It's just strike it's a good way to reminisce. Great. Uh, reminiscence can also be part of preparing someone for end of life. I mean, this is the reality. Those of us who live in the context of faith, hopefully we can approach this differently. Uh, I think about the ministry of our Stevens ministers, and our elders, and our deacons, and our pastors. Sometimes going to someone's home, or sitting with someone and saying, tell me about your life. You know, helping them to assign meaning to what may feel like disparate kinds of activities. It is not uncommon in my work that we see people holding on to life far beyond what would seem normal. And it, we say it, we can't believe they're still alive, they're still, still with us. And sometimes that has to do with unresolved work. I had, when I was the director of nursing at Thomas House here in Washington, I was called in on a Sunday afternoon by a daughter. And I dashed in, and, and I remember how quickly I went in because I went to work in jeans. I never go to work in jeans, just saying. Uh, so I got there, and she said, I wanted to tell you that my brother arrived, and we have reconciled. And this was a brother and a sister who had been apart for a number of years. I said, have you told your mom? She said, no. I said, why don't you go in and share that good news with your mom, that you and your brother have reconciled, and that you will take care of each other. She did. Her mother passed it within an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe that that helping that mother resolve that what must have been a heartache to her, even though she couldn't say it. If you kids will just figure it out, I'll be able to leave. Mm -hmm. I mean, she wasn't able to articulate that. But I've seen that more than once, where people appear to be holding on till they're able to resolve something. So what a gift. What a gift for children to give to the parents who might be struggling with a memory that's causing them pain. Who of us as parents? doesn't want our children to to love each other and, and that to me that's the greatest compliment to our parenting. Uh, Brian is here with us today and Brian will quickly tell you that more than once I've said the best gift you can ever give dad and me is to love and care for each other because we won't always be here. So anyway, Brian knows that right Brian? I want to say thank you to Brian for being here. <laughs> I do too because you know who wants to go here and talk about old people stuff, right? Uh, Brian just returned from Iraq yesterday, so we're thrilled to have him home safely. And thanks for being here, Brian. <laughs> it also affirms a sense of identity. This is an image that we often use when we're teaching this kind of topic. Where, I mean, have you ever looked in the mirror and you, whoa, who is that? <laughs> that's my mom. <laughs> Oops, nope, that's me. Uh, so this is, this is kind of how we work to, with reminiscence to help people discover that they're still who they are, even though their hair is grayer and maybe thinner and whatever, and maybe we're not thinner, but our hair is. You know how that goes. Uh, so I, I love that reminiscence. Tell me about this stage of your life, or tell me how you feel about this. Share with me how you arrived at that. So affirming a sense of identity. So connecting it with spiritual reminiscence, it's a way of telling a life story by bringing the meaning to it. And we have the privilege to do that because we, as people of faith, we have a hope that is not always part of the repertoire of those that we serve and care for. Um, it's also a way to bring meaning to all these emotions. And no matter how cognitively impaired someone is, they still have the capacity for this range of emotions. Emotions, their ways of expressing it may not match the way we think they should express it, but it's still there. And then, as I mentioned by my earlier story, can help us to resolve issues that that might be troubling us and may be part of that tension between in integrity and despair. So, spiritual reminiscence. So there are all kinds of things that can prompt us in our reminiscing. Have you ever had someone walk into a room and just a flood of memories or thoughts or recollections uh, came to mind? Sometimes just their presence or the way they begin to tell stories. I've already shared with you that 
that Mary and I come from a big storytelling family. We'd sit on the porch, we'd sit outside, we'd, we'd churn ice cream, we'd pick fruit, we'd do all kinds of things all the while telling each other stories and remembering things that we did together. Objects can be sources of reminiscence. We can pick up something and it can remind us of something. I'll share one with you that was just an exciting find for me. Later you'll see that I, I'm a big fan of journaling. I was at a street fair in Delray, Alexandria a few weeks back and I came across this vendor who was selling these journals, but the journals were made out of um, old books. It so happened that I found this journal, The Boxcar Children, my absolute favorite childhood book. If you haven't read The Boxcar Children, just get it. Just see it. <laughs> but I remember all the memories when I saw this cover. Mrs. Frankenstein used to read it to us after we were on the playground at lunch, and she invited us to put our heads down on the desk and picture we were playing with these children. So now the next time I'm ready to start a new journal, I get to write it in this journal that's very connected to my past. So that's an object that can be a wonderful prompt for a reminiscence. Icons, photographs, sites, have you ever smelled something and you just were flooded with a memory? Uh, and it's healthy, that's healthy. This is the way we connect things. And I would say music. And music, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Song. Songs, absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. Poetry. Poetry, There's, yeah, there, thank you. There are so many more things that we could add to this, absolutely. As part of the work that I do, I go to communities and help them ensure that they are in compliance with regulations and with standards. Uh, this very week I'm going to Charlottesville to a new client, Assisted Living. One of the standards that I will be seeing if they're in compliance with is a standard that we have that says that their activities must cover all these domains, physical, social, cognitive, intellectual, productive, sensory, reflective, outdoor, and natural world activities. You can see how you can take every one of those domains and wed it to the concept of reminiscence, right? Whether they're making bread or whether they're outside in the butterfly garden, um, all of these things can have reminiscence as an element to make sure that these domains are covered. So I'm going to speed through a couple of slides and just share with you some of the objects and the intersects for reminiscence in my life. Would that be okay with you? I'll go real fast through these, but, but I think it'll show you that you too have the opportunities to do this. This slide was actually prompted by uh, one of the children's servant, uh, sermons that Dr. Rennick did a few weeks ago. Remember he had a basket and he reached in and brought out the Bibles that were written in the different languages to show the children that God's Word has universality to it. And so I thought, you know what? My Bibles, the collection of Bibles that I have, have been very, very meaningful in my life. So I went and actually some of them were in storage. We went to storage and I brought them out. And, and I just pondered, what's the role of every one of these Bibles in my life? And there are just a few of them. Uh, the one that you see up in the top is the one that I use when I travel. <coughs> it's quite worn, but I want to read to you because this one is meaningful to me. This is the New International Inclusive Version. And it's 1997, and it says, Serge saw to it that this version was avail available to me from the UK while still banned in the USA. <laughs> so that's, that's my international inclusive. I'm glad to tell you you can now get it in the United States. But Serge wanted to see that I got that inclusive language Bible earlier on. So as I looked through these, I did not remember until I looked inside, my parents bought me a Bible when I was five. I was just beginning to be an early reader. How important it was to my parents that I had my own Bible to carry to church. And I grew up in a faith tradition where you didn't use a, there was no pew Bible. You were expected to bring your own Bible. That was my very first Bible. Notice the zipper. I thought that was just beyond cool, having a Bible with a zipper. So <laughs> um, And then my parents gave me yet another Bible in 1959. Four years later, they must have realized that I was ready for another Bible. And my Bibles, my childhood Bibles, have things written. There I wrote, Jesus does all things well. Don't know where I got that from, but that's, that's part of that Bible for me now. Um, here's one that I, I've memorized 207 Bible verses. I was a little bit of an overachiever at 12. We had, to learn, we had to memorize 50 Bible verses. 
so I added a few to it, and this was given to me by the junior church of my, of my church. And I thought about this and how meaningful that red Bible was many years. A bit worn, you can see that, I broke it down. But then I think about this as connected to the Bibles that we give our children, and hoping that in the future they will hold that Bible and remember that we were a loving con congregation and wanted to make sure that they had that Bible in their hands. Donna, you said Hamilton Cousins, but it says Donna J. J. Black. Yes, my, my father's name is Bill Black. My mother was Mary Lou Hamilton. Mary's father was Jim Hamilton. There were nine of them. So we're his black. <laughs> yeah, that's my mar that was my mother's married name. I'm my mother's Mary Lou Hamilton Black. Right. But it's on my mother's side that, that Mary and I are one of 31 cousins. <laughs> And we love, we love that. This page in my Bible has special meaning. You might not be able to read it, but up at the top, God answered prayer on these two different dates. This was a prayer for my younger sister who lost many pregnancies. But in God's good timing, and in God's good timing, my, my sister and brother-in-law were blessed with two wonderful boys, Tyler and Sam, and Mary both them as well. So that's a memory that I'm able to have through my Bible, reminiscence of of the many years of praying together for God's blessing. Okay, here I go again, so get your tissues out. Um, this is one of my favorite verses. I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Where the children begging bread, they are always generous and willing free, and their children will be blessed. You will see that I wrote that in 1991 when Matthew started at Gordon College. And when we left Brian at Black Forest Academy, when we went off to Russia, mm. that was not an easy time, losing both of my boys to someone else's care in the same moment. The date at the bottom, 692, is Irina. Uh, Irina was the first woman in Russia who came to me within weeks and said to me, Do you know God? Do you believe in God? I said, I do, and I do. She said, Well, I need you to, I, do, I don't yet, and I need you to help me, which began a relationship of, of my. A Bible, st Bible study and stewarding and shepherding her through uh, over a year till she could come to know God for herself. And that was an answer to prayer uh, for me where I'd ask God to, would he specifically allow me to lead three people to Christ? And that's how many I led to Christ in Russia. I should have asked for more. I know. Where was my faith? But Irina was, was one of those. So that's a wonderful memory of how God answered that prayer. And this is that leadership Bible what, that was given to us when we agreed to be mentors through the National Leadership Program, so that's very meaningful. I want to recommend to you a, a system that if you don't have a prayer model that works for you, this is one that has served me very well for many years. Uh, I don't know if any of you know the name Armin Besswein. In the church that I grew up in, he did a lot of speaking and teaching on the topic of prayer. The power of prayer, the discipline of prayer. So he had introduced us to this system where you just use five by eight cards. On the right hand column is what you're praying for on a daily basis. What are you committed to praying for every day? And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Now, at, at the risk of embarrassing some of you, the tailors get, get prayed for on Tuesdays. That's just their day. But you also see that Ginny and I have a particular prayer commitment. So Ginny gets prayed for on a daily basis. And John, you know, I'm sorry to embarrass you, but you'll see that Laura Treadway is on my daily prayer list and has been since, since Laura was ill. Um, I want to tell you that this works. It keeps us focused, but it keeps us immensely grateful. There's a couple on here that you don't know, but I will tell you their story. Tim and Gretchen had been married for 30, over 30 years, and their marriage was, for all intents and purposes, ended. She left, it was irreconcilable. Just this week, and these are friends that I know through Chaplin. Just this week, we got an email as board members that it was a miraculous gift of God that they had gone away for some time together and were reconciled. So if you're, if you're praying hard and long and many years for something, do not give up. But what I have here are many years of these cards. And I used to throw them away, but then I thought, well, I'm not going to do that because on the back of these cards, I have verses that have been very, very meaningful to me. So if you don't have a model that works for you, may I just recommend this one to you. On the back of it, at the bottom, you can see uh, some of these verses. They have no rhyme or reason. They're just the verses that come to me as I'm praying. Journals. I won't bore you with all my journals, but that's some of them. I've kept journals for many years. Uh, and some are fancy. Uh, the one, Anna knows I'm a journaler, so she made me the one on the left. My friend in London gave me the one on the right. Doesn't matter as long as it's yours. 
As I said, some have gilded edges, some are just very plain, basic journals. And then I told you the story about the boxcar children. There is something about reading your own handwriting and experiencing God's work in your life over time. That, to me, is very powerful. So this is just what it looks like if I were to open them all. That's the only time I did that was for the photograph. I, would, I don't sit around admiring my journals. I added this one recently because I thought hymns, and, and you mentioned this, and music can be so powerful. You know, we can play a song. I had a, uh, a resident at Thomas House who had not articulated in two years. I was sitting at the piano playing a hymn, and she began to sing. Words came out of her mouth from who knows where. So music, never disparage. And I love to just look through music. The one in the front is the Ukrainian hymnal. That was a baptism by fire, don't you think? When I was brought up front in the Ukrainian service to play the piano, I don't speak Ukrainian. So Serge is sitting there whispering in my ear what I'm supposed to do, what verse, slow down, speed up. But, so that's our Ukrainian hymnal right there. <laughs> Uh, objects. We can have things in our life that just bring back memories. This is me and my new bike. I love my new tiny bicycle down there in the corner. And that's important to me because it's part of how I want to stay healthy. But because we were, when we were little children, we did not have, we had one 20 inch bicycle to share between us. We lived in a country and our driveway was gravel. So we didn't have places to go riding around town as you would if you lived in town. But then I thought, I love the one up in the top because at Shell Point, where I'm on the board, we have that kind of a bicycle with the wheelchair attachment to the front. Can you imagine if you used a bicycle all over town but you'd lost the ability to do that, how fun it would be to be riding along and feel the wind and just have that experience of being on a bicycle? Well, if you have that, that kind of bicycle attachment, you could do that. So that object, can you imagine, um, this is just a, a sample, but all the thoughts that would go rushing through someone's mind as the wind blows past. Okay, spoons. My granddaughter loves my spoon collection. She's Montessori, so she categorizes them by color, <laughs> location, alphabetical. So spoons, but while she's playing with them, she'll say, Dee Dee, tell me about this spoon. Where did this spoon come from? And, and every spoon can come with a whole story. So uh, I never set out to collect spoons. Someone decided it was a good gift to bring me <laughs> and easy to pack when you're traveling. So hence all the spoons that become storytelling objects. Art. This is a, a photo, art and photograph. You can do this in your own house. There's nothing magical about mine. And I use the word art very loosely because we don't have extensive art, but we have meaningful art. So this is my father's homestead. This is the black homestead that was right next door to the house that I grew up. That house has been since torn down. But I mean, it's a whole part of my childhood. So having that hanging in my bedroom is, is very meaningful. The top one is, uh, the old Maine at Nyack College where Serge and I first met and where we had many dates. The one below is Wurzburg where Serge was born. So every one of these can trigger a memory for someone. Some of our collection from when we were in Russia, a boutique that we got early. The one on the right is one that I love because there was a movie that came out called Redemption when we were in Moscow. And one of the lines from that movie is, what good is a road if it doesn't lead to the church? That's in response to a question. So that reminds me of that one. Um, the one at the top is, was a gift from a friend in the Philippines. The one below is the Charles Bridge in Prague, which just is surrounded with all kinds of great memories. This is called Ode de Cologne. If you were to turn it on its side, it's a music score. Mm -hmm. So I love that one. <laughs> right, hanging right there next to Serge's dusty cello. Any day now, Serge's a nice cello. <laughs> Sorry about that, Serge. Oh, I just picked it up. <laughs> but you know, the verse that I had, had us consider earlier is because knowing that God has a plan for our life, I picture that as the vessel <coughs> that can safely hold our reminiscence. Right? Knowing that we're boundary, all of our memories, all of our experiences are bound, boundary by this reality. This was God's promise to me when I had cancer. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am He. I am He who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. And that's straight off one of my cards because that was what God knew I needed to get through that cancer experience. Another promise that I love is from, this, from Psalm 37 with these active words. Spend time with this. This can bring lots of reminiscence of when you have to trust, 
when you have to dwell, when you've got to enjoy sex pastor, when you're delighted, and, and the desires of your heart that could follow from these kinds of practices. It's easy to talk about reminiscence, isn't it? But we, we don't live in an era that prompts us to take the time. You know, we have technology. We panic if we leave our phone at home. Or, goodness, if it discharges early, we're in trouble. And, and it's unfortunate sometimes, I think, for me, I'll speak for myself, that all of that technology robs me of the time. Just, you know, Facebook and all those things that have very good aspects to them can rob us. But I love to be reminded, be still and know that I'm God. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. I'll uh, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. These, I think, set us up to benefit from our readiness. And uh, the photograph that I put there is a view from our new balcony mm -hmm. in a very small, downsized condo. And I find that a very nourishing place to reminisce. Is so. that Marina Towers? It is Marina Towers. 10th floor? Yeah, I have Ten on the friends in there. Yeah. The yeah. Ten floor. You did yeah. give us a sunset. Yourself. Uh, well, no, that's sunrise, but I think I don't know where that place is in your world, but I hope you have it. Is it a corner of a room or a seat or a deck or a front porch or a stoop or something? Uh, but to, to the point that our church has been working on, uh, the small groups, it's within communities that are reminiscing can take on so much rich meaning. And we've had a wonderful small group and, and have just told each other stories that it didn't occur to us we needed to tell, but we're telling them in response to the topic. So I, I think that it fits with, with the mission. There are some wonderful models of remembering that I think are worth considering. Uh, Deuteronomy has several uh, where uh, the Israelites are reminded to remember even when we take communion, that's an exercise in reminiscing, uh, an exercise in remembering. These are some thoughts to ponder from, from a, a sociologist. The past empowers the present, and the sweeping footsteps leading to the present mark the pathways to the future. Wherever a story comes from, whether it is a familiar myth or a private memory, the retelling Retelling exemplifies the making of a connection. Uh, I think this is worth chewing on in, in our private moments. So here would be what I would consider to be thoughts for the <coughs> How does reminiscence complement and support our spiritual disciplines? What is the role of the church? And we being part of the church, capital C, in inspiring and supporting reminiscence. How might Sabbath observances support spiritual um, remembering? I, I'm sure this is a bit of personal disclosure that I've been really doing some study on the concept of day of rest and Sabbath uh, to challenge myself. It's very easy when you work as many hours as many of us work. Uh, Sunday becomes a crash day, but I don't know that that's exactly the best use of that day, just to fill up with all the things we didn't get done on the other day. So being intentional about space providing space for the reminiscence. Uh, so we're back to that model that I showed you from Dr. Powers. So how does spiritual reminiscence relate to all of these elements within the well, what we call the well-being pyramid? Identity. We have our identity in Christ, and part of that is the identity within community and connectedness and the security. I mean, we have relationships when we can remember things safely together, not always pleasant things. And not all of our memories are rosy and glorious. Sometimes they're full of mistakes and regrets, but they still are instructive. Autonomy, meaning, growth, and joy. I mean, at the top of the well-being pyramid being the joy that comes from not despairing, but seeing that things fit together in our lives. I love this verse, um, let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. I think this is just fraught with opportunities for remembering and being grateful almost as if they should always travel together. What a great passage as we enter this season of Thanksgiving. I hope that it's true for you. And this is my last slide, and this is a sunrise slide, in case you're wondering. I caught Nadia, our granddaughter, in really a moment of reverie. She was standing one day when she was staying overnight, and, and as I thought about the thought I wanted to leave you with, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Is that the message that I convey to my grandchildren as together we reminisce? I would hope so. 
I was just remembering that the last time I spoke to you was on the topic, topic of the grandparents' influence in my life, and I had just become a new grandmother. That little one that prompted that invitation turns 12 today. So those years pass so quickly, and do we utilize our reminiscence for our own spiritual growth, but also to benefit our families. So thank you for allowing me to share just a little slice of God's work in my world. And if you have questions or thoughts or reflections <coughs> or rebuttals, I'm fine with all of them. This is Washington time for rebuttals. <laughs> And stand, would you stand if you can? Because I think it's important to share the conversation. I'm standing, okay. Uh, Thanks, Sean. That was beautifully done. Dr. Bawani in his book talked about how his view of end of life decision making from a medical standpoint has evolved. Mm -hmm. And he said that you know, the uh, medical schools were even starting to teach a softer, mm -hmm. less technical approach. With your end of life contacts, mm -hmm. have you seen any of the younger doctors showing a little or is your main rather than trying this and trying that, considering the family with the outlook of the DC? Yeah, actually I have, and what a grand question. Have, and he's asking, are we seeing a, a change in that? And I would say yes, and in some ways that's been supported by the whole residence rights and advanced directives movement that insists that we bring residents into the decision making. And as part of the person-centered care, uh, movement within long-term care. We're also seeing, and what we call the MDS, this is an assessment instrument that we have to complete on residents every 90 days, mm -hmm. or with change in condition. Uh, the expectation is that the information be derived from interview with that resident. Uh, so we have a number of tools. I think that, I, I'm going to be very bold, that I think in some ways the field of nursing is maybe a little bit ahead of where some of the medical field is, and if you're a physician, please forgive my, my huge generalization there. But I think as nurses, as we learn to ask another set of questions, and as we become emboldened to be better advocates for those we serve, uh, I believe that most doctors want, I mean they do, all doctors want to do what's right. And for the decisions that they make, it's often for lack of information. So as we can lead them down the path of what we know, what we know with our residents born out of our relationship. That's one of the other aspects of, of our movement within long-term care is that no more do we move nurses and staff all over the building. We keep them what's called consistent staffing so they come to know the patterns, the fears, the concerns of that person they're serving. That's the nurse who can speak to the doctor and say, as I've come to know Mrs. Whomever, this is what I know about her. This is what she has said to me in the quiet moments of our relationship. So. Yes, I think we have good hope in that. Okay, mm -hmm. other questions? Yes? You mentioned the downsides of social media and that yeah. kind of thing, but also I, I noticed yesterday as I was kind of on Facebook, how people use reminiscences like to deal with tragedy like in Paris. Mm -hmm. And people put a lot of, they'll put like pictures, and it's mm -hmm. a post pictures about family times in Paris yeah. or visiting Paris at maybe a different time mm -hmm. to help deal with tragedy. And yeah. so there's a mm -hmm. uh, uh, on. Facebook as well. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Thank you. In fact, my own entry yesterday, I said, I welcomed my son home from Iraq in the very same moment when I realized there are families who will not be welcoming home their children today. So, yeah, thank you for that. That's, I, I'm on Facebook enough. I mean, not always, but enough to. Thank you. That's great. Great thought. And, could, and maybe we ought to be challenged to be using it more appropriately. Other questions? Yes, class. There's such a growth in the dementia that's been mm -hmm. formed. Um, what I see is a tension between not just information that doctors and nurses need, mm -hmm. but the time. Yes. I mean, I yeah. I just diagnosed with with, with uh, uh, asthma this summer, mm -hmm. and my first uh, exposure to the doctor was very bad. Mm -hmm. and I found out, you know, I, I was taking an hour and a half late, and she was behind, mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to go back to her. Told some other people told me how good she was. Mm -hmm. But she told me, she said, I, I really have 12 minutes on the average for the information. She read the article in the paper today. So, so how, how, <coughs> how much can you learn and what have you? So I'm, I'm now dealing with, with my friend Bill down at some yes, point. Yes. And I'm thinking of his wife's dementia has turned to a point now where he knows that she, inside, 
Stella has some cognitive, mm -hmm. but she has no communication skills. Mm -hmm. Who has the time to sort that out? Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she is violent in her frustration, very mm -hmm. agitated. Mm -hmm. And I, I, more and more, I hear people dealing with their, their, their parents or their spouses mm -hmm. with dementia. How do you bring more time to this when we mm -hmm. have a nurse and doctor's profession that are frankly running out of people? Well, I think I have several answers to that. I don't see that changing because of our payment structure. So that said, I think that arming those of us who have opportunities outside the care setting and, and developing those skill sets, I mean, maybe there are more opportunities within our faith and health ministry here, I don't know, to, to do more caregiver training and support and using our ministry roles for that. But the medications, by the way, are not the answers. Psychoactive meds, psychotropics are not going, this is not a, a serotonin issue, this is not something that's going to be resolved. But learning or feeling like we can tap the dignity of that person and, and try to understand some meaning in that. Back to what I said earlier, um, I think we're going to, as a nation, I think we're going to have to figure out why we expect it to be the doctors and nurses and why we don't think it's going to be us as families and churches and caring and loving communities. Uh, so I don't think it's just solely or even primarily going to be the, the professions. I wish I could give you more hope, but I, I feel very well armed for whatever could come within my family, and Mary and I have some family members who, who are needing these kinds of services, but maybe as we teach each other, and it's not just nurses. There are some family members who have learned some amazing strategies, and I'm sure you see this, Kathy, as well. So. I don't think the answer lies just with the profession. I think, I think your best answer is that. I think yeah. that kind of presentation needs mm -hmm. to be given to the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of, I, I don't want to act like it's not, there are lots of caregiver support. But I think we have a mindset in our country, I'm um, going to take mom to the nursing home and they're going to take care of it. And those become the angry daughters, trust That's me. Coming. Coming. I, mean, I, have, I have an example that's simply quite and um, recently we had a patient who was hallucinating, seeing bugs on the wall. She was very challenging to care for. And I happened to come by, and the nurses were at the desk rolling their eyes. Oh, she's seeing bugs. Oh, oh. And I looked at them, and I said, can you imagine how frightened she must feel inside? And they all just stopped. They, it never occurred to them how she felt. And it did take on a whole new way of their caring for her. They were much more compassionate. Yeah, her. and it was That's just a one-liner that really brought it all into perspective. So we can do that. We can make small little strides that we do help and, and change. And not forget our humanity as nurses. Uh, and I like the emphasis rather to try to get under the skin of their distress rather than talking about the behavior that is distressing us. Yeah. So that, that's a really good example. I think John has yeah. one more. Moderator says we're out of time, but I just want to say that your presentation made me think of all the. I'll say, crap, I have in the basement. <laughs> and how you got into a two-room condo, I don't know. That. <laughs> uh, we do rent a small... Oh, storage area. Small, small. Thank, thank you all. God bless you.